Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Planned Parenthood, who believes everyone deserves access to affordable, high-quality health care. From birth control to STD testing, from PrEP to gender-affirming hormone care, Planned Parenthood provides personalized health care with or without insurance. Appointments at PlannedParenthood.org. Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing their all-new Rate Shield approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Quicken Loans will lock your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash DSM. Listener supported. WNYC Studios. Have you always been comfortable talking to people who are not your age? Um, I've always been comfortable talking to... Uh, well, it's, I, I, I don't know how to answer that question honestly. I've never felt like I'm particularly good at talking to anyone, <laughs> I guess is the answer. <laughs> this is Death, Sex, and Money. I like you, and I like hanging out with you. The show from WNYC about the things we think about a lot. You don't have to pay now. I know you're good for it. And need to talk about more. I just killed my best friend. And your worst enemy. I'm in a sale. Author John Green is 41, but he's built a career on his ability to connect with teenagers. His best-known young adult novel is The Fault in Our Stars, a story about two teens, both dying of cancer, who fall in love. But even before that book came out, he had a huge following of teenagers online. He reaches them where they already spend a lot of time, on YouTube. Good morning, Hank. It's Wednesday, August 31st. Apparently, it's talked to people... Back in 2007, he and his brother Hank started an experiment where they posted weekly videos for each other. And soon, other people began to watch, too. Now, more than a million people subscribe to their channel, many of them teenage fans looking for advice and a sense of community. So, Hank, I want to address the people who have recently ended or will soon end their formal education and enter what is known as the real world. Okay, the first thing that you'll notice upon entering the real world is that it is neither more or less real than any of the previous worlds you have encountered. But you'll likely notice that the real world does have... When John was growing up in Orlando, he didn't feel like he had a real sense of community. He was close to his parents and to his younger brother, Hank, but he also spent a lot of time alone with his thoughts. And his head wasn't always a comfortable place to be. I always understood that when I was a kid, uh, kind of intuitively, that a big part of who I was was what I was thinking. Uh, And the feeling of not being able to choose those thoughts, not being able to decide well, that's an irrational worry. Let's leave that one behind. Not being able to reassure myself and not being able to be reassured by people who who loved me and cared for me was really scary, in part because it, it meant that myself was built on a foundation of sand on some level. It meant that there was no bedrock. John was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder in his 20s, but he struggled with anxiety long before that. When he was 14, he asked his parents to transfer him out of public school to go to a boarding school in Alabama. I was really struggling socially. I was really struggling academically. I was, I was a really poor student. And it seemed to me like a, like a way out, like a chance to reinvent myself, a chance to become a different person and not be stuck with all of the memories that everyone, you know, in my school had of me. Did you change the way you dressed or change the way you presented yourself when you started at boarding school? I I did a little bit. When I was uh, at public school, I kind of wore like a trench coat and I wore a lot of black. and, And then when I went to boarding school, I tried to be more, I tried to transition from like the cure to, like, the Grateful Dead kind of, like, uh-huh. go with more of a hippie vibe, more, like, tie-dyed shirts. Trying to be. I mean, I, I really was never remotely successful. What, what do you mean? What was not – how are you not successful in sort of casting well, that image? Well, for starters, I did not particularly like the Grateful Dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there was that problem. But also, like, I'm just not somebody who can convey, like, laid back and comfortable – you know, that, that's, not, uh, that's not the vibe I give off. 
When John graduated from high school in the mid-90s, he went on to Kenyon College in Ohio, where he majored in English and religious studies and planned to become an Episcopal priest. I didn't have a particularly, like, wide understanding of possible careers, you know? Like, Uh I thought that I could be a professor or a lawyer or a doctor or a minister. (laughs) Like... So of those jobs, minister seemed like the one that was the best fit for me because I liked going to church and I was Episcopalian. I still am. Yeah, I don't know. It was not very well thought out, if I'm being honest. John was accepted to divinity school. But before he started, he spent six months ministering to sick children at a hospital in Ohio. It was in Columbus, but I was living at the time in a little town called Mount Vernon, which was near where I went to college, and then I would kind of commute an hour and a half to Columbus every day. What was that work like for you? It was hard. It was tough. I have a lot of admiration for people who work in children's hospitals for longer than six months because I couldn't. It takes a certain kind of um, fortitude that I didn't have. Were were many of the children that you worked with, were they dying? Yeah. In a lot of cases, they died. Um, In some cases, they didn't. But as part of the job, while you were on call, you'd have these 24-hour on-call periods. And while you were on call, you would get called to any serious trauma case. And so sometimes that meant a kid had, you know, rolled over on their four-wheeler and they were sick but they were going to be okay. And sometimes it meant a kid had rolled over on their four-wheeler and they were going to die. And, you know, all of my fancy ideas uh, gleaned from theology about why why bad things happen and and why um, there's evil in the world. Like all all of those ideas meant uh, meant very little to me um, when it came to actually being, being with people in those situations. Do you have any memories of, like, what would what would you do when you were driving home? You know, it varied. A lot of times I'd just listen to music and kind of scream along to it. Sometimes I would drive in, in silence on difficult, you know, on the hard— I remember the hardest days, you know, I would drive home and have to stop. Uh, a lot of times I'd have to stop and just— uh, just cry for a while, cry until I fell asleep, and then I'll wake up and drive back to my apartment. Um, most days I could, you know, most days I would just drive home and take that time to separate myself from uh, from the hospital and, you know, be in my, my real life. But uh, some days that just wasn't possible. John decided Divinity School was not going to be the right choice for him. He moved to Chicago without much of a plan, started writing his first novel, and got a day job at Booklist, a trade publication for librarians. But after a few years of that work, John was feeling stuck. For the first time, his anxiety and obsessive thoughts became debilitating. I had a really bad period of mental health um, in 2001, and... I tried, I tried to quit my job, and very generously, my boss uh, told me to go home for, for a couple weeks and see if I could uh, recover enough to return to work. But I'd been unwell for a long time, and I'd been getting worse for a long time. And it was one of those things where I didn't notice how desperate the situation was until, you know, I was in real danger and I was, uh, you know, not eating. And yeah, I mean, there's like a two or three week period where I consumed no calories except for in the form of Sprite. So Mm. that's not great. Like (laughs) I probably should have recognized a little earlier in that period that things were not uh, firing on all cylinders. But yeah, I mean, it it was, uh, it was, it was awful. It was awful. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Did you say, I'm sick, to your boss, or did your did your did the people you worked with recognize that you were sick? Uh, the people I worked with recognized that there was something wrong, but, you know, I'd needed 
I'd already needed a lot of support. <laughs> so I, I don't know that I don't know that it looked from the outside like a crisis because I was still going to work. I was still getting my work done. I was still productive. And I think I, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't accept that there was a problem until, uh, I mean, I did, I knew, I knew that I was in bad shape, but I didn't, I didn't accept kind of the scope of the, the size of the crisis until, uh, one night I called my parents and I told them that I needed to, uh, not, not, not be alone and mm -hmm. sorry it's okay they were they were there in like 12 hours hmm. it's good you made that phone call Yeah, I mean the uh it is good. The you know the kindness involved on the part of my parents in that is uh something I'll always be very grateful for. And then I went on this uh weird road trip with my dad. Um the uh the craziest part about that trip was that we stopped in Indianapolis, a city where my dad was from, but I had no relationship with. You know, I didn't, didn't think about Indianapolis one way or another. We stopped in Indianapolis at the Borders bookstore downtown. I just remember walking around that bookstore and just thinking, like, oh, my life has, I have no future. I, I'm never going to be able to get a handle on this. I'm never going to be okay. I'm never going to have any uh, stability in my life. I'm too much of a fuck up. I'm too much of a, of a disaster. Uh, you know, and now I live in Indianapolis and I, yeah, I, I think about that all the time. I think about that almost every day. Coming up, John Green on writing a best-selling high school love story, even when he didn't have a lot to go on from his own life. I wanted to fall in love. I wanted to have long-term relationships. It just kept not working out. I, I think for, for a lot of reasons, maybe largely because like being 15 or 16 years old is not particularly conducive to, uh, you know, stability. <laughs> For the past few weeks, we've been collecting your stories about sex ed fails. The things you learned about sex when you were young that you later found out were totally wrong. This voice memo came in from a listener about a terrible sex ed class he had in high school. The instructor brought up a boy to the front of the class. And then he starts talking about how condoms prevent pregnancies 90% of the time, which isn't even true. It's more like 98% if you're using it correctly. And then he puts the boy on this table like he has him laid down. And then out of nowhere, he pulls out this cinder block and he's dangling it over this boy's crotch and screaming, like red-faced screaming. How do you feel about those odds now? There's a one in 10 chance I'm gonna drop the cinder block on you. Is there something you learned about sex, either in a class or just something you picked up from a friend that makes you cringe now? Record a voice memo and email it to us at deathsexmoney at wnyc.org. And also, I want to let you know that John Green and his brother Hank have three different podcasts that are now part of WNYC Studios, where we produce our show. One of them is The Anthropocene Reviewed. Every episode, John reviews two completely random things on a five-point scale, like CNN, cholera, pennies, 
the Taco Bell breakfast menu. It sounds like it doesn't make sense, but I promise you it does. And it's actually a lot of fun. Check it out at theanthropocenereview.org. And there's also a link on our website at deathsexmoney.org. On the next episode, I check in with Rachel Swiddenbank and her husband, Hiroki Takeuchi. I first talked with them last year, after Hiroki was paralyzed from the waist down in a biking accident. They've made a lot of progress since then, and gotten more used to the things that won't ever be the same. We used to be those, like, those loser people who'd, like, try and get through the airport as fast as possible and turn up as late as possible, and then get off the plane as quickly and, you know, be the first to passport control, like it was some sort of race. Um, And now it's like, We're always the last people off the plane. Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Planned Parenthood. We believe everyone, regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, or immigration status, deserves affordable, high-quality health care. From birth control to STD testing to PrEP and gender-affirming hormone care, Planned Parenthood provides personalized health care with or without insurance. Appointments available at PlannedParenthood.org or call 1-800-230-PLAN. Planned Parenthood. Care no matter what. Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing their all-new Rate Shield approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Quicken Loans will lock your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash DSM. Rate shield approval only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. Hello, Death, Sex, and Money listeners. My name's John Green. I'm the author of several books, including The Fault in Our Stars. I also co-created some educational video projects with my brother, Hank. That would be me. Together, we are the hosts of Dear Hank and John, a podcast from WNYC Studios in which two brothers provide dubious advice and answer your questions on everything from airplane etiquette to organic chemistry. And of course, share the latest news from Mars, which is a cold, dead rock in the vacuum of space, and AFC Wimbledon, a magnificent third-tier English soccer club. Subscribe to Dear Hank and John wherever you get your podcasts. And as they say in our hometown, don't forget to be awesome. This is Death, Sex, and Money from WNYC. I'm Anna Sale. A lot of John Green's books are about young people experiencing the all-consuming rush of first love. For John, that first happened in college. I was 19. It was my sophomore year. And this was long before meeting people on the internet was a normal thing to do. But I was a very early internet adopter because my dad brought home CompuServe in like 1992 or 1993. And it was a friend of mine from the student forum on CompuServe in the early 90s. We just talked on the phone and um, became friends. And then I drove out to meet her one like fall break or something. And it was pretty immediate. I think that most of the work, most of the groundwork had been laid before we even met in person. And then we fell in love and had a really lovely and complicated and difficult and good romantic relationship for a few years and then eventually broke up. Yeah. I imagine it must have felt so exciting for some. It sounds like you were a person who, from a young age, like loved the idea of love. Exactly. And then yeah. to feel it, it must have been like, yes, here it is. Oh, yeah. No. And I mean, of course, the great thing about falling in love for the first time is that it feels totally unprecedented. You know, it feels like nothing like that has ever happened before in human history. In his mid 20s, not long after his mental health crisis in Chicago, John started dating a woman named Sarah. We had this like one year long email correspondence before we actually uh, hooked up for the first time. I was trying to think of the proper word. I was going to say dated, but we didn't. We didn't go on a date. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a, a pattern for you, seducing seducing people from long distance with your words over the internet. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, <laughs> I would say I would say that it was a mutual seduction. <laughs> um, the best gift I've ever received is when we got engaged. Sarah um, had all of those emails uh, 
printed and bound and gave them to me. And we do occasionally go back and look at them and, oh my gosh, talk about two people who were stunningly oblivious to the fact that they were uh, clearly interested in each other. Uh, but yeah, it, it worked out eventually. They got married, and when Sarah got a curator job at an art museum in Indianapolis, they moved there. John settled into a comfortable routine, writing full-time and making YouTube videos with his brother. Then in 2012, when he was 34, he and Sarah had their first child, and John published The Fault in Our Stars. It has sold more than 23 million copies and was made into a movie in 2014 that grossed more than $300 million. No, and when that happened, it was really exciting. Um, and it was also a little bit intimidating because it felt like there was a lot of um, attention on on that story and then kind of by proxy on me. And I had always wanted that. I'd always kind of sought that out. Um, but when it happened, it was definitely a little overwhelming at first. I, I want to ask you about 2015. Um and after the sort of scope of the incredible massive success of The Faults in Our Stars was clear or had become more clear, um, and you're working on, trying to work on your next novel, um, and was that the, the first mental health crisis you'd had since you were in your early 20s? No, but it was definitely the worst since my early 20s. Um, I'd had a few, but on some level that's to be expected. Uh, I don't think that there's like a magical way out of, um, having difficult periods for me, even with, you know, the techniques of therapy and the medication I take and stuff. Um, but yeah, the, what happened in 2015 was definitely much, much worse than anything else until, uh, except for when I was in my early twenties. How was it different to to feel yourself in crisis when you're now not a single man, you're married, you have you have kids? Um, yeah, did it feel different? It did. I felt um, I felt horrible, and I felt uh, I felt like a total failure as a as a dad, as a as a husband. I felt um, yeah, totally totally lost and. It was difficult for me to, you know, engage with the outside world enough to read a menu, let alone, uh, you know, try to make breakfast for my kids or whatever. And this might sound off, but but I'm wondering just what you described in Chicago. It was you sounded so alone when you were in crisis. Um, yeah. Did it in some ways? make it easier that you had people around or did it compound the feeling of isolation that you couldn't feel connected to them? I, I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't think either. I think the isolation in both cases was kind of absolute because at its core, it was so internal. I mean, part of what made both those experiences so terrifying and so painful what was the fact that I couldn't describe it to anyone and so when I was in that terrible uh, constant men mental anguish the, the, that like intense psychic pain it felt uh, very isolating and alone you know because I was the only person who had that pain mm-hmm Were you still posting videos on the internet during that time when you when you think yeah. back and think I was at my lowest th at that point? Oh yeah, no, I look at those. Uh, I actually just watched one the other day for. Uh, that doesn't matter. I mean, I am interested. You're watching it. I was looking back, trying to sort of pinpoint when you, when it was. Yeah, when... but yeah, if you watch any of the videos from like the few weeks around there, you can see there's like you can, or at least I can see like something in my eyes, like there's something visible, like a fear, a panic almost, uh, that I can see in my eyes. And uh, I mean, I would edit those videos and upload them and just 
that would be the only work I did all week. Um, because, you know, at this point, my brother and I have, you know, been making these videos back and forth to each other for 12 years now. Mm -hmm. I've made a video for four or 500 Tuesdays in a row. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I wanted to continue that. It was important to me to continue that. I also knew that it's not good for me to withdraw. You know, I, I felt an urge to withdraw, but I know from experience that um, that it's not healthy for me to with, withdraw further from the world. Like, you know, that only compounds the problem, even though it feels like a solution. And then I got on the, a medication that started working. I started to feel better right, at, right near the end of the year, like right near Christmas. Very early. Very early 40s. Um, yeah. How does it feel to be a middle-aged man? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, it was about five years ago that I put on a pair of pants before a cocktail party, and I said to my wife, I feel like I look like a middle-aged man in these pants, and she paused for just like a second too long, and I oh. realized it happened. <laughs> You're like, it was a joke, and she's agreeing with me. With yeah, her and she's silence. not laughing because <laughs> she's looking at me and she's seeing a middle-aged man. <laughs> um, what kind of pants were they? <laughs> they, they were khakis. I threw them away. I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> this was before I had accepted it. Uh -huh. uh, but if you double my age, it would be a very reasonable age at which to die. So I, get, I think that's the definition of middle age. Um, I let me. I, I'll just answer the question honestly. I love my life right now. Um, I don't know if I'll love it tomorrow, but I love it right now. I, I, I have this sense of stability that I that I didn't have for for a lot of my life, and um, yeah, I don't know. I I totally underestimated adulthood when I was a kid. I thought like adulthood was something that you ran from and then eventually it overtook you and then you had to just like stay still until you died. Uh -huh. I thought like you stopped changing. I remember when I was a little kid looking at my dad's shoes, you know, like my dad had had the same pair of shoes for like 10 years. And I remember thinking, what would it be like to have your feet not grow for 10 years? Uh -huh. That sounds awful. And now I have 10-year-old shoes, and they're so comfortable. How could I not have understood how comfortable they are and how nice it is to, to feel comfortable and how when you feel comfortable in parts of your life, that allows you to take risks in other parts of your life. And I think adulthood in general is totally underrated. That's John Green. His newest book is called Turtles All the Way Down. It's about a teenage girl who struggles with OCD. You can find his and Hank's full slate of podcasts at wnycstudios.org. And if you find yourself in a moment like John did, having a hard time and needing to talk to someone, the number for the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're open 24-7. Please ask for help. Beth, Sex, and Money is a listener-supported production of WNYC Studios in New York. I'm based at the studios of the investigative podcast Reveal in Emeryville, California. Our team includes Katie Bishop, Annabelle Bacon, Stephanie Joyce, Joanna Solitaroff, Emily Botin, and Andrew Dunn. The Reverend John Delore and Steve Lewis wrote our theme music. I'm on Twitter at Anna Sale. The show is at Death Sex Money on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And don't forget to send us your stories about sex ed fails. We're collecting your voice memos. Email them to us at deathsexmoney at wnyc.org. One thing I loved about making this episode is it allowed me to tell the team about my love of the country song Strawberry Wine by Dina Carter. Because believe it or not, Strawberry Wine came up when I talked to John. 
When I was at boarding school, I drank a lot of Strawberry Hill, this Boone's Farm. Oh, yeah, I know that. I don't even think they're <laughs> legally allowed to call it wine. I, I think that they have to call it a malt beverage. It's like Kool-Aid with, like, just gross booze inserted at the very end, if I remember correctly. That's exactly right. I recently <laughs> had some, and it it does not hold up. <laughs> I'm Anna Sale, and this is Death, Sex, and Money from WNYC. Death, Sex, and Money is supported by Planned Parenthood. We believe everyone, regardless of gender identity, sexual orientation, or immigration status, deserves affordable, high-quality health care. From birth control to STD testing to PrEP and gender-affirming hormone care, Planned Parenthood provides personalized health care with or without insurance. Appointments available at PlannedParenthood.org or call 1-800-230-PLAN. Planned Parenthood. Care no matter what.